named in honor of Richard and Lucille Durrell. Uh, Richard was a professor in the department for many years, specialist on the uh, Pleistocene, and his wife was uh, a uh, the acquisition of land at the uh, uh, edge of Appalachia preserves in Adams County. Display case here. Didn't well, the display really? case has moved over there. Okay. It's the same display case. Oh, okay. I and I, we're going to some uh, interesting fossils. One of the drawbacks here is that the light is not very good. Together of unusual types of fossil preservation, Lagerstätten. So we have some of the famous uh, nodules from the Pennsylvanian of uh, Illinois, Mazan Creek here, ferns, uh, some uh, fossil horseshoe crabs, um, shrimp, uh, things like that. In the middle part, we have some specimens uh, from different places. One, which you won't be able to see very well, the Burgess Shale slab from Canada to Cambrian that has some soft-bodied worms. Uh, we have a nice polished dermatolite. And then there are some specimens from the Solhofen limestone. The German shale or slate from Germany with beautiful fossils of sea stars, uh, green river fish from Wyoming, and then a beautiful crinoid from uh, the Devonian of Ohio. Yeah, Northern yeah, Ohio. Yeah, so, yeah. Like that, so these are sort of special so cases of preservation. Mm -hmm. So there's different trace fossils, tracks and trails made by trilobites. One of the most notable specimens is the specimen with the mirror under it, which is a flexicolimony trilobite. Uh, which is, okay, that is something nice, but not all that rare. But underneath is the burrow the Rusificus trace fossil that the trilobite actually dug. It's, it's one of the rare cases where the, the trace fossil is preserved with the trace maker. And that particular specimen is one of very few that I've ever seen. Um, Dr. Davis and I just came out with, so we repeat. Famous Ordovician Eurypterid, the Megalograptus, <coughs> which was discovered near Manchester, Ohio, many years ago. And eventually it was, well, it was brought, donated to the university, but it wasn't described, I'd say, for 30 years. I think the discovery was made in the 19, let me see, 30, it was quite a while. 38, yeah. Yeah, and then finally, in 1964, Ken Castor grabbed us and included these beautiful drawings that were done of what they think the whole animal looked like. The specimens that you see here are actually the types. Now, I know the museum center would like to get those back down there. Uh, technically, the fossils we have here are part of the museum center's collection. Oh, on the upper shelf there was constructed at life size to match the um, idea of what the animal looked like. In fact, Casper directed a famous model maker. What? You can also see, but our specimen shows the the uh, um, and some of the appendages separated of, of our megalograptus. There's also a a few specimens <coughs> here of isotelus. Uh, one in plaster is a fragment of what must have been a huge. A very old classical displays of fossil formation, different types of fossilization. Second site at Florence, which uh, was found after this. The piece here is what we call Florence One, was discovered um, in the 1970s, just after I came to DC. And it was through the dry dredgers that that was discovered and accessible, and the fact that we got the material that we've had here. This is just a little piece of what we have reassembled, and some of the photographs if you look closely there, the lighting is a little better in that case. You can see Idrio asteroids on the brachiopods. And of course, tonight, the talk about Idrios from Colin Sumrall will be another version of uh, Idrio asteroid studies. Um, actually, uh, Ron could probably explain the display over here because he, but uh, Ron Fine made a very nice poster with a reconstruction of Ordovician crinoids. Uh, 
Actinocrinus on here. And uh, he reconstructed what we think was the original length of the very skinny stems of those, which could have gotten this probably as long as you see there. Um, I think those were composites. They weren't actual complete specimens. But I, also at the last meeting, um, uh, Dan Cooper had an amazing specimen of a, about that much of a, about half that much of a articulated dictanocrines with the crown on it, see for the collections. So we know that they, they got really long. And this was a really neat display that Ron made up about this and, and uh, displayed and very kindly allowed us to keep here. Uh, uh, ben Eston, giraffe period. With, I think he did an especially good job with modeling some of the vegetation. And that's one of the things you want to look at. Did they show uh, Professor Lowell, Tom Lowell, uh, supervised this, and has some of the specimens from around here of very old uh, logs, spruce logs, glacial uh, cobbles, and uh, uh, sediment blocks that have been collected as part of their study of the glacial deposits in this area. <coughs> now, a couple of displays over there, girls, particularly Richard Girls memorabilia. Uh, the third case is, is sort of a incomplete. Perhaps the biggest attraction here is the Mosasaur. Leave that for last. Uh, the Mosasaur, uh, of course, has nothing to do with the geology of Cincinnati or Ohio. It's, uh, dates to the Cretaceous period of Kansas. So what's it doing here? Well, that was a kind of a long story. Um, a number of years ago, I was quite thrilled to see, uh, well, I've always been thrilled to see big, big beasts like that in museums, you know, and, and um, museums in uh, Kansas and Colorado had uh, beautiful mosasaurs on exhibit. And that was about the time, it was just after the time we moved into this building. And we had this museum, and we thought, well, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have something big in here? Because if anybody remembers the old tech building when we had the elephant, Old Chief, well, Old Chief didn't make it over here. Old Chief moved to the museum and resides there in various parts. And, uh, so Old Chief wasn't even a fossil, it was an elephant. But we were able to get this mosasaur. And it, it did uh, come from uh, Kansas. Uh, it was collected by uh, people who were doing field work for a museum with uh, the University of Wisconsin Geology Department. They have a really, really nice geological museum in their building, uh, quite a bit bigger than this. And uh, they've done a lot of collecting of ver uh, vertebrate fossils, particularly in the West. And they had actually collected one of these mosasaurs and prepared it and mounted it. So they had one. And they were doing more field work uh, about 1990 in uh, Kansas, looking for other interesting fossils. And they found this mosasaur. And fortunately, we had a, a, uh, we had a person on the inside, basically. Uh, Ann Herring actually was a member of the Dredgers for the time she was uh, in Cincinnati. Uh, very avid uh, interest in fossils. And she had worked at the University of Wisconsin Museum, and she was still going out in the field with these people. And I said, gee, if you could get us a mosasaur, it would be great. We'd love to have something like that. Well, they got it. <laughs> and somebody found, found one, and they uh, very kindly excavated the whole thing for us. Around the corner here, there's a poster of uh, showing how it was collected. A few steps in the floor. A little bit of the story of the collecting of it. Uh, it was found on private land on a ranch in Kansas. And the collectors had a very good working relationship with the ranch owners and had permission to collect the fossil and did a really, really fine job of digging it out, jacketing it in plaster. If any of you have gone to the dinosaur field school in Montana, exactly the same techniques were used as you would with dinosaur remains. Uh, I was able to help.